Good morning, Bangalore. Okay, what a great morning to start our first session talking about money, and that too with none other than Sharon, who is considered the one of the most uh, popular financial influencers in India. So, welcome, Sharon. Can we have a huge round of applause for Sharon? Thank you, thank you, everybody. Always good to be back in Bangalore. It's uh, my favorite city, as always. So Sharon, we all know about uh, your journey, but uh, our audience would be really keen to understand how it got started because we know at the time of COVID, you actually moved to the world of digital and started a finance uh, influence channel. So how was the start like? Can you share more on that? The start was basically me uh, in my parents' uh, house, in my bedroom, uh, shooting videos in my bedroom, right? I had just... Uh, uh, I had a Nexus 5 phone and a broken phone stand from my sister and um, I had the natural sunlight uh, coming from the window. Uh, back then I did not know uh, the names of any of these equipments. Right? Today, Godox is like a very, very commonly used term in the creator economy because it's the something that gives you artificial light. Uh, but back then my shooting time was 2 to 4 p.m. because during, during that time the sun was at the, you know, the right amount of brightness to shoot. Right? So, uh, very fond memories back in the day, uh, but didn't really, like most people would assume that it was all a plan, like everything that I have done so far, I envisioned it two years back, but it's, everything is on the fly. Uh, the, the initial motivation to start content, as most of you would be knowing, uh, was to improve my MBA application. Uh, and then once uh, I applied for my MBA and I got into Columbia Business School, and I was like, okay, the, the job of content creation is done, right? This was just going, always going to be a hobby. And now it's time to go be serious and get my MBA degree and become an investment banker and then get into private equity. I mean, that was the plan, right? But then something happened. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, I had about 100, 200K followers. Uh, never really thought, you know, this could be a, you know, uh, a big thing beyond that. But then all of a sudden it reached a million followers uh, in like 11 months. Right, and then I started thinking, okay, uh, Columbia MBA is going to co cost me two crores, right? And I'm making just about that kind of money over here. So why do I want to give this money to Columbia MBA and give up this income earning potential, right? So that is where I had a big dilemma. It was not easy. I spoke to multiple people. Uh, I had to speak to one guy who had both an MBA degree and is a content creator. Uh, he turned out to be Akshar Srivastav another famous uh, finance content creator on YouTube. He told me, go. <laughs> he, he told, it's important to get your MBA degree because you never know when content creation uh, can end. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, I decided not to go and instead decided to start the one person club. Uh, it again, one person club was again, uh, you know, supposed to be like a side hustle along with the content creation income. But that sort of became way bigger than I imagined. So point I'm trying to make is nothing is planned. It all happens on the go, right? You just need to get started. But you really actually got your maths right in terms of weighing whether you want to go to Colombia or do content creation. Yeah, I mean, I did a big math actually and the math, what I did back then um, versus what the math has actually happened, that itself is a big difference, right? So uh, when I was doing the math, doing that, you know, pros and cons analysis, um, the the assumptions that I put in for one person club to be better than going to Colombia were kind of already uh, drastic in my opinion. And only if I meet those aggressive milestones, it would make more sense than going to Colombia. But it has far surpassed those assumptions as well in terms of how big I, I thought it could become. Sure. So how has one person club gone over the years? Yeah, so uh, firstly it was called the one person finance club. Uh, it started as a simple finance course, uh, that is what most uh, education content creators do. If you want to make more money than what brand deals are giving you. Like firstly, what content creators realize a uh, little bit later is that brands are not your friends. Right? A brand might reach out to you on email saying, we love your content, we want to work with you, you know, let's pay for one of our brand sponsorship and you think that, you know, brands are your best friends. They are not. They are only there as long as you are relevant and as long as you are getting views. So this is something that I realized uh, a little later, but much before most of my uh, peers. 
uh, is that I need to build something of my own, something which I control and even if I am not relevant again in the future, this something that I create will last beyond me and make me money, right? So that, so it started off that way. So the natural progression for most education content creators is to build an education program or an educational course. So because I was a personal finance content creator, I ventured into a personal finance program. And back then there was no personal finance course of this magnitude. Everybody was selling stock market course, swing trading course, futures and options trading course, because these are easy to sell. Because people are really hungry for money. People want quick growth. Uh, just to give you some context, the number of crypto accounts in India is more than the number of DMAT accounts open in India. That sort of should tell you, uh, you know, how uh, money hungry uh, people are, right? We just want the option which makes us the most amount of money. So coming back to the educational courses and only stock market, swing trading, these kind of courses were available. Nobody wanted to learn how to do asset allocation, how to do insurance planning, how to do tax planning. All these are considered very boring topics. So, but I still took it upon as a challenge because that's the only thing I knew, right? I didn't know swing trading or option futures and options trading. So I had to really make something out of personal finance itself. So that's how it began. And on day one, I still remember, uh, I expected maybe 300, 400 people to come up for my, that's the first time I was conducting a live masterclass on Zoom. I had just taken a Zoom subscription for 500 attendees. Uh, I put up a story on Instagram saying, hey, I'm conducting this masterclass tomorrow. Uh, you know, it's 4.99 rupees, please come. I put up that and I went to sleep. When I wake up, I expected, okay, maybe 300, 400 registrations would have come. Let me open and see. It was 5,000. 5,000 registrations in 24 hours. Straight away 25 lakhs in one day. I could not believe it, right? <laughs> and then I had to go to Zoom, increase that subscription to 5,000, pay another 2 lakhs to Zoom. And that's how it began. And fast forward to today, um, we have um, um, almost two and a half lakh people who have taken the masterclass. And post that, we have built a community of people who are lifetime members of the One Person Club. Uh, these are like the really serious learners, people who have really deep pockets, people who are uh, the serious investors in the country, people who the fintech brands and the banks are after. And uh, we have 50,000 of such people uh, in the One Person Club currently. And uh, going forward, we are going to uh, now go into financial services, right? We've uh, just gotten SEBI registered. Uh, I've never, never said it out there. We've just gotten SEBI registered. And next step is to get into FinTech and offer financial services. So we know that uh, <laughs> one of the most popular FinTech entrepreneurs, Nikhil Kamath, has also invested in a 1% club. So what got him attracted in 1%? I mean, he's a close friend, <laughs> to be honest, right? <clears throat> See, it was a 10 crore investment and considering the, you know, the level of wealth uh, this man has, right? So I would say it was more like a write-off for him. Uh, but having said that, I was really, for me, it was still a big deal, right? For, for him, maybe it was like, you know, just one of the investments, like a friend, right? It was an investment that you do in a friend's company. But for me, it make a, made a big deal of difference and I'll tell you why. About a year back, uh, there was a lot of negative publicity against content creators like me, yeah. right? The whole Finfluencer saga. Okay. Uh, and SEBI recently came out with its consultation paper at, as well. And the whole thing stemmed from a few miscreants in the content creation space who were uh, taking negative advantage or um, you know, undue advantage of the distribution that they've built on YouTube funneling that audience to Telegram and selling, um, you know, services of stock tips illegally without being SEBI registered. And unfortunately, these miscreants are also called Finfluencer. And who happened to be the poster boy of Finfluencer the, the year just before that? This guy, right? So it was a really, ba a really bad PR nightmare for us. Uh, and once uh, Nikhil Kamath, uh, you know, invested in the company, it brought a lot of trust in that space. Right, SEBI also, uh, you know, really, really uh, started appreciating what we're doing and now we got the license, right? So it was a really, really big impact uh, when someone like Nikhil Kamath comes into the cap table and the kind of impact it can bring is unmeasurable, right? It's, in a, it's an immense impact that he has brought for us. So when you just mentioned that uh, now your next aim is to build it as a fintech enterprise, 
So, from a creator to an entrepreneur, uh, when you think about, uh, I mean, uh, you, when you're just only giving financial lessons to now building a fintech company, so how is that transition and uh, is there some learning, unlearning which is happening at your part? Yeah, so the more and more I get into entrepreneurship, the more and more um, delayed gratification you end up in. What I mean by that is, when you're a content creator, the ROI is immediate, right? You, if you are able to build a certain distribution or a certain number of followers, uh, then making money is easy, right? You, ha you basically have zero cost to make the video and a brand comes and tells you, hey, take five lakhs, yeah. right? So that's very quick, right? You get the money within, within a few days. But then once you get into the education sector, let's say I want to build an education program, mm -hmm. it took six months to sort of build the infrastructure like it was initially it was a three people team firstly two people team me and my sister and then it had to become a ten people team to build the educational uh, company and it took us six months to launch and then I got that 5000 registrations okay. right now entering into fintech I think it's going to be a four or five year game before I can see the ROI coming out because I first need to uh, right now the team is 100 people by the way right 100 people team and Right now, now we just launched fintech, we've launched, lo just launched our financial services. We are now providing one-on-one -on -one financial planning services uh, to our members. And the problem that we're trying to solve is that India has around roughly 1,300 financial planners who are SEPI registered. Uh, 1,300, that's 1,300 for a population of 1.5 billion last time I checked, right? 150 crore people, right? Of course, you can see the huge disparity in the supply versus demand. That's number one. Number two is that India is getting richer every single day, right? We are in an explosive state in this country, uh, the likes of which has never been seen anywhere across the world, yeah. right? And India is going to get richer and richer. The number of people who are rising from the middle class to the upper middle class is going to skyrocket in the next four or five years. The number of people who filed income tax of more than 10 lakhs last year was one crore and it is projected to increase to three and a half crores by 2030, right? So even if, forget the 150 crore Indians, if I just look at the three to four crore Indians yeah. who would desperately need financial planning services and there are only 1,300 of them, right? So that is the space that we want to target. Can we create an army of financial planners across the country? Just like how you would go to a clinic or a doctor when you have, uh, you know, like a health issue. Can you go to a financial doctor when you have a financial issue? Can there be, uh, you know, like 100 different branches of 1% club across all the top cities where, where there are like lakh financial planners spread across the country? That is the vision that we are trying to solve, right? So in four or five years time, my vision, I, of course, I can't put a lakh financial planners by myself. That just goes to show how big the market opportunities and there are so many more uh, you know, so many more companies that can get into it. But our vision is to have at least 1,000 to 2,000 financial planners catering to a lakh, two lakh people. And there are three and a half crore people waiting, right? I can maybe target a lakh, two lakh people. So that is the market that we are after and it's going to take us a lot of time. Sure. And uh, we heard your success story and uh, no story is only about the roses, of course, their guns, of course. So I, can't, I can't, couldn't hear that. Okay, please. sorry. I'm saying that we heard your success story and I'm sure uh, there are not just up, there must be down moments as well. So, I mean, while teaching India the financial lessons, what is the biggest financial lesson you have uh, learned yourself? The biggest financial lesson? Mm. I think for me the biggest financial lesson has been um, and it, it doesn't come from me, it came from my mother is to live below your means. Um, th about a couple of years back when I had just uh, started being a content creator and seeing the money that I was making, it was very easy, uh, you know, had it been any of my you know, college friends, I'm sure they would have bought three cars and you know, a couple of bikes just to you know, show off or bought the big house. Uh, you know, living way above their means. But thankfully, I did not do that. I lived below my means. Maybe if my income increased 20x, I increased my expenses by 30, 40%. And because I was able to keep my focus and keep my uh, uh, expenses in place, I had built up a certain amount of corpus, which firstly, A, allowed me to be financially independent. What I mean by financial independence is that the money that I have saved and invested 
is invested in the right places uh, because of which the annual income I'm getting from that money is more than enough to support my expenses, right? Now, because I was able to reach that state in life, I could take even bigger risks. So, starting 1% club, the risk that I, I, sh I, I had taken, meaning I had to put upfront capital, you know, so far we have invested almost 25 crores in 1% club in building what it is today. So, all of these risks you can take when you are financially independent, right? So, I think that has been the biggest learning lesson for me. When you are making a lot of money, do not overspend, save it up so that one day when you are financially independent, you can truly uh, take big calculated risks in life, which can really make big impact to the society. Sure. So, before we throw open the floor for uh, audience uh, Q&A, I want to know any uh, personal finance lesson you can give to our audience. I think they will ask questions, uh, <laughs> but uh, the biggest personal finance lesson according to me is, I mean, there's a lot, but the biggest one is figuring, uh, uh, first focusing on investing in assets. And this is something which Robert Kiyosaki says a lot. And now, there's a big misconception out there. People are saying, you know, who is this Robert Kiyosaki? He himself is in debt, you know, $1.2 billion. So, uh, who am I, why should we listen to him? You guys are forgetting the fact that he has purposely taken that debt to buy assets. He's not taken that debt and partied it in, you know, Las Vegas or Dubai. He has not spent it all. He has gone about and bought real estate assets. And those assets, which is primarily in the US, not in India, right? The rental yields in US is two times to three times more than what it is in India. So, all of, most of that money is invested in those assets and it is making him additional income, right? So, that is something that people need to realize that all kind of debt is not bad, right? The term debt is automatically having a negative connotation because of our Indian mindset that, hey, I should not have any loans or liabilities. But all kind of loans are not bad. For example, a home loan, which you're taking, is not a bad loan. You don't need to, like, if you have two crores in your bank account, and if you're about to buy, a, let's say, a house in Bangalore, three BHK house in Bangalore for one and a half crores, most people will be like, you know, okay, let me, I have two crores, why, why, I, I can buy the house outright. That's a bad decision. You know why? Because the cost of capital is very, very low. Uh, the effective interest rate of home loans after the tax benefits is around five and a half, six percent. So if you have two crores lying in your bank account, why would you give away one and a half crores to buy that home outright when you can borrow money from the bank at four and a half percent uh, or five and a half percent uh, blended interest rate? Why, like, why would you give away your money when it can, you know, be invested in the market and get you 12%, 15% returns? So, you really need to look at what is good debt and bad debt, right? So, my, my, coming back to the question, my main advice is early on in your career, invest in assets. Now, in India, unfortunately, I consider the house that you're living in is not an asset. So, assets could be, you know, your mutual fund investment, equity investments, you know, FDs, gold. These are, these are good assets. So, what most people do is, as soon as we get married, when we are late 28 or late 29, almost 90% of our money goes into our primary residence, which is not an asset according to me, because it is not going to pay for the next 50 years of your life in terms of your expenses. It is just a, sh a shelter over your head, and a shelter over your head can be bought with far lesser money if you know how to use your capital. On that note, uh, the floor is open for questions. Please raise your hand. The mic will be passed on to you. Yeah, please pass on the mic to the lady. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm from Australia. And hi. Hi, my name is Tia. I'm curious as to what the what is the diversity of your audience? So, how many women versus men, and whether you see a difference in the needs between those two different audiences? in terms of the length, the level of financial literacy? Yeah, so the demographic data, 80% is male, 20% women, and most of them are from your top five metro cities, which is where all the wealth is in, in this country. Mumbai, Bangalore, Chennai, Delhi, Hyderabad, and Pune. Uh, primarily Bangalore and Pune because I'm a Bangalore boy, so most of my followers are from there. Uh, in terms of... Uh, the major difference, I would say, is, of course, between men and women and the way they look at finances. 
the women in this country, they usually don't, uh, are not accustomed to managing the money by themselves. They rely on a male figure to give their money. They give, probably give it to their dad when they're young and then they give it to their husband. So I think women are naturally not that inclined to learn about money. But I think that is slowly changing now. Um, and um, like most of the uh, people uh, who recognize me in public, it's men. But if it's, uh, if, if it's a woman, they're usually working in a big four company like your KPMG and PwC. They already have a finance background. Uh, but I've not really come across women who are recognizing me without having a finance background. So there is still a gap in this country for women financial literacy to increase and for them to take control of their money by themselves. Thank you. Hi, Sharon. This Hi. is Kavya. I'm a follower uh, you know, on Instagram last two years and I kind of fall in that category where uh, you know, I earn and I give it to my husband to do the you know, money <laughs> management. Uh, my question to you here is, um, what, what advice would you give to someone like me? I mean, I was a studious kid doing a job, doing my work, you know, I've not learned much on the finance side and I feel uh, I don't want to break my head, right? And uh, now that I realize that, you know, it should not be in that, um, you know, bracket. And I have a lot of friends who are, uh, you know, like me and uh, I would like to know what advice would you give as where to start, to start, take control of, you know, our finance. Perfect. So firstly, look at money as your source of freedom. So when you're giving your money to somebody else to manage, you're giving up your own freedom, right? So why should you be answerable to somebody else whenever you want to buy something, right? So my first advice is learn it yourself. Now you mentioned about you don't want to take the time and effort to do it. Uh, and you don't have any finance background. Neither do I. I don't have a CA, CFA degree and I didn't even go for my MBA, right? So I am a mechanical engineer, right? So that cannot be an excuse for not learning about finance and it doesn't take a lot of time. Most people confuse, okay, CAs take five years uh, or whatever, three, four years to become a CA. I don't have the time to do it, but that's very, very different, right? What CAs are learning is a comprehensive tax laws and ecosystem of our country and most of it is related to you know your business taxation and all of that but for most of us we don't need to learn about business taxation what we need to learn is about our personal finance taxation and it's not that much uh, if you ask me 10 to 15 hours of dedicated effort over one month should get you to the point where you can manage your own money and that is what we do in the one person club like in four weeks 15 to 20 minutes per day is the time commitment that everybody needs to give and then we give them financial planning tools Right, we build a community of people. So the challenge with education today post getting a job is that people are really, really lazy. Right? We procrastinate a lot. Right? It, it's very easy to buy an online course, but it's very difficult to watch it and complete. Right? Go back to your school and college days. The reason why you were studying is because there was a strict teacher, you were competing with your friends, your mom used to scold you, right? And there was an exam at the end, right? How will, if edtech doesn't bring that into your learning, you're never going to study. Because after coming back from home, after a 9 to 5 or a 9 to 7 job, you're automatically going to switch on Netflix because you're like, you're gonna, I'm going to have to reward myself. There is this new show out there. I want to have to watch it, right? So if that is the... Uh, world that we're living in today, this low attention span world, it's going to be very, very difficult to learn anything new post, uh, you know, getting a job. So that is why choose uh, an educational course or an educational company, which sort of tries to build that environment of your old classroom environment back into this. So what we do is that we have a mentor allocated to you. We sort of also have a community of 50,000 people who sort of help you solve your doubts and questions. We have an exam and assignment. So that is why our completion rates is close to 70%, right? And the average EdTech completion rate is 6 to 7%. So the biggest problem that you guys have is not access to knowledge, it's your own procrastination. Agreed. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we will be taking one last question. I see both of you having mics. I will be only able to take one last question. We're just running short of time. Hi. Uh, hi, Sharon. Hi. Uh, my name is Sagar. I am from Pune. So, actually you answered my question about the debt and asset and robot chaos, okay? So, just to take that question forward, now we have one mindset who is creating the asset, okay? Uh, and now we have a, a one more mindset like Elon, who doesn't have the asset or he's selling his assets. So, what do you make out of these two mindsets? What is the different thing? 
Well, Elon Musk is big enough to be his own country, right? So I think it's not fair to compare us with him. Uh, see, Elon, most of his money is equity in his companies and he takes loans against that, those equity. So what happens is, let's say Elon Musk is worth 200 billion dollars and let's say most of his money is in uh, you know, Tesla or SpaceX or whatever it is. Now, if he were to sell his equity for money, he has to pay tax on it. So he will not do that. So he'll take a loan against his publicly listed equity and when you get a loan, that's not an income right? and there's no tax on it. Right? And the loans in US is very, very cheap. Here a loan would be 9 to 10, 11 percent at the minimum. There he can get a 3 to 4 percent interest rate loan. Right? And the taxation there is 40 percent. Right? So the rich really no ways to you know, really uh, uh, leverage money and they have understood money to such an extent that eventually what ends up happening is that the bulk of the taxation as a percentage of your income is borne by the middle class and not by the rich. Right? So you need to start learning these things because uh, the more you learn about money, the more you realize how it can be leveraged to your advantage. Right? It's not a fair world, but if you learn, it, you, you can have an unfair advantage for yourself. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, we will conclude the session. There. I am really sorry, you're running I out of time. Came, I, came, I came for the event because of Sharon Hegde itself. <laughs> Ritham, I was okay. saying it's okay. Please, please, please. Sure. Yes, 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 please go ahead. <laughs> the fan following, you know, it's real. Let's go ahead. Hi, Sharon. I came Hi. to the event for you itself. Basically, I saw the event, I saw the criteria. I'm a huge follower of yours, okay? So, I'm Bangalore boy. So, my name is Altya. So, I'm an early stage entrepreneur. So, what financial advice would you give it to me like an early stage entrepreneur in my success story? Like, what's a key factor? Yeah. Like, I'm a solo founder right now. So, I'm looking for investors. So, what advice would you give for me as a budding entrepreneur right now at this stage of the Indian era? Yeah, great question. Uh, and I would say even I am a very early stage entrepreneur myself. It's just been two years for me and I'll tell you some learnings that I have which I'll share with you. Number one. Um, you don't necessarily need investors money to build something, right? Because most people assume that only if I have investor money, I can hire expensive people to do the job for me. But the real magic happens when you can buy, when you cannot buy of course, when you can hire uh, affordable people and train them to be as good as the expensive people, right? When you're really early in your game, that is the way to do it because otherwise your cost will be really, really high. And uh, even if you raise investor money, what ends up happening is you end up in a hiring frenzy and keep hiring more and more expensive people and your fixed costs become so high and when there is a market down, which is currently the situation that we are in, your fixed cost will be high and then you start burning money. So number one is hire people who are maybe two to three years of experience, take the time and effort to train them. It's not like I hire this person, give them the task to do and they'll do it. No, you need to sit with them, train them and then they will take it up, right? So, if I had to tell you today, today I have people in my company who are at, you know, 6 to 11 lakhs per annum, who are working at the level of a 35 lakhs per annum guy, because I took the time and effort to train him. Now, this guy is fresh, is a fresher right out of college, right? So, that is still good money for him. But because I have taken the time and effort to train him, he is operating at a level which is of a 35 lakh per annum guy. So, that is the biggest lesson that I have uh, uh, learned, is that you don't necessarily have to hire expensive people to do the job for you. Thank you. If that answers your question, can we have a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen? Just adding on to that bit, we have an investors meet happening at it's from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. If anybody wants to push, we have an investor zone. Make sure you guys head out there. Thank you so much, Sharon, and thank you so much, Vanita, for coming in uh, during the first fireside session. Thank you so much, guys. It was wonderful talking to you guys. I hope you guys learned something new today. And all the best for the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon.